in Ephesians, the second chapter, the 10th verse. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> for we, we, excuse me, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Let us pray. Dear Father, truly, we thank you for this time. I thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. I thank you, Lord, for allowing me to even come. I thank you, Lord, for your word and your son your Holy Spirit, and you, God, the magnificent one. Thank you, Lord, for all things. In Jesus Christ's precious name, amen. Grace. Grace is a mystery. You know, and, and as I've studied, I am just, um, uh, it's even deeper to me than, than before. Uh, but I'd like for us to consider a few ways, a few things that we've already went over, just to kind of refresh, just to look back for a quick second. Grace chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. Grace has given us all spiritual blessings through Jesus. Grace has determined that we will be like Jesus and with Jesus one day. Grace has made us, made us accepted in Jesus. Grace proved the blood of Christ that washed us from our sins. Grace reached out to us when we were dead in, sin, in our sins and headed to hell. Grace loved us. Grace gave us life. Grace has secured our future. Grace has secured our salvation. Everything we possess as believers is through and by the grace of God. We are nothing and we have, we, that we have received. Think, think of all that God has given us. You know, most of the time we, we absolutely um, get, get kind of down and, and, and upset and, you know, maybe a little depressed or something. And so we... We take and we, um, we kind of, you know, we don't actually talk to God, right? None of y'all do that, do you? You don't ever say, why God? Um, but we, sometimes we kind of push um, our limits in the, sense, in the sense of, you know, we think, well, I shouldn't have said that. Well, it's time to repent. But, but I mean, if we just think about all that God has done for us, it's, it's almost like, you know, I look back in my life, and as I've said before, you know, I think of things that I've said and done, and the shame comes because even before I was saved, he was kind to me. And each one of us should look back and just think about our lives, and, and, and in that looking, we can, we can absolutely be able to praise God with even, even greater ferocity of, of, of voice and, and that inner being that we are to show God how much we truly appreciate him. So we receive, we, we, we deserve nothing that we have received. We purchase nothing we have received. Everything in Jesus Christ given to us is by free grace from God. God, had, God wanted nothing in return. We all want something in return. You know, as a salesman for a lot of years, I put a lot of effort into, you know, building relationships and, and doing things that was unnecessary because I knew that it would have a return. Selfish. Um, I felt I was doing a service and things of this nature, but in God's sense, you know, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't expect that. And as we serve him, we should absolutely understand just how magnificent he is and in, in, and what he wants from us. And as we go through the night, um, I pray that if you have a question or something, you know, on Sunday morning, I, I like to preach without any interruption. Sunday night, Wednesday night, anything that's on your mind, I don't, I don't care if it's off the message, ask the question. I have a good friend that calls me a lot of nights, usually 9.30 to 10, and he asks me quite a few questions as he's studying the Bible. And, I, you know, there's all, I can always get him a um, a commentary, but I'm not going to do that. Why? Because we have class, 9.30 to 10. 
So if you want to call, listen, this is what I do. This is what I love, and I'll, I'll be glad to answer your question. You know, I kind of like to kind of cut it off around 12, 1 o'clock, but I will go beyond that. He called, he called me the other night at almost 11 o'clock, but he'd already, we'd already spoke about 30 minutes around 9, 30, 10, but then he came up on something about, you know, in, in Romans, the seventh chapter, and if you go through 6, 7, 8, it can get right confusing. But he had perfect questions, and I just loved it. So about 11 o'clock, he calls me back, and I just happen to still be awake, and he said, i got to know this because I'm really confused. And so, I, I, of course, I answered him. And so I just encourage you, during this time or any time, please. So we, we see all the things that grace and Jesus Christ has brought to us, and so, um, which brings us to God the Father. A word about workmanship. Paul begins this verse by saying, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Um, do you believe the Bible is inspired by God? I pray everybody understands it is. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That covers everything. Everything. So as we study his scriptures, we should take the individual words and see how he put them together and what he was using them to get us to see. So the word workmanship means that which is made a work, a work of art. It comes from the word that we use as poem. So it's, it, it really refers to a piece of literary workmanship. Um, and usually by the artist or the, or the writer's you know, greatest achievement in literature. And in other words, it comes down to a masterpiece. Now, now think about that. That which is made a work, workmanship, I'm, I'm sorry, a workmanship. Think about that. So Paul is saying that his, God's redeemed saints are his masterpieces. You know, a lot of times, and, and I understand when people, I understand when people get kind of, um, get kind of, Brother Johnny, All right, Paul is saying that, um, that the redeemed saints of God are his masterpieces. So the saints are his greatest achievement. Now think about that a minute. You know, a lot of times because I'm, I preach on sin and I preach that we are kind of without a lot, um, a lot of things going on in our life because we, we usually stay down in the mud. But think, he calls us his greatest achievement. Now if you look up in the sky, you think, goodness gracious, stars beyond numbers. You think of all the things going on there. I, 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 I marvel at all these things, but he calls us his greatest achievement. So the saints are the work of the, of the master potter. The redeemed saints of God are the results of God's loving industry. He made us. He absolutely, he made us in, in, in 2 Corinthians 5, 5, it says, Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. The word wrought in that verse means to fashion. We are his workmanship. So he has taken us and brought us together. You think about it. Every aspect of your life, every aspect of your, your being, God made. If you think about the raw materials that God started with from saved sinners, it's pretty incredible. Amen? Amen. The redeemed are God's letters to a lost world. Paul says it this way. Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, Written not with ink, but with the spirit of a living God. That's first, Second Corinthians 3, 2 through 3. If you are saved, your life is God's letter to a lost and dead world. We need to think about that. Now, if God sends a letter, and we each are, 
then hopefully you can read the address and you can read the return address. And if you get the letter out, you can actually see each of us are, are stamped. Uh, we have the mark of Jesus Christ. Amen? So he has written his love in you and on you and through you. He tells the world that he loves sinners because he uh, saves each one of us. So you are God's billboard. If you think about it, we could be up on I-10 going west, just kind of planted, but God could read us. Or we can be amongst all people and they can read us. Do you know how we can absolutely affect the world? It's by doing what he wants us to do. So show off. Show off the goodness, amen? Our Kent Hughes gives the following. By the way, let me just stop there for a second. I, I've never really explained some things. You know, most preachers, you know, the Lord kind of guides us where we're supposed to go, and we listen and things like that. So sometimes when I'm preaching, I may use somebody else's thought or example or illustration. Y'all know that, right? Well, how I'm so good, I, don't, I forget to give credit where it's credit due. So if it sounds real good, it's not for me. Amen? All right. I, I don't want to dis, uh, disillusion anybody, but understand, I, I have, you know, a library at home. I have a library on my laptop, and I use it. I study. I study a lot of hours for each message. Now, this, this one, because of circumstances, it, it, I didn't put all the time that I normally do into them. But so, as I say, R. Kent Hughes, I hope to make sure I let you know who did what, where. Amen? I study behind a lot of different pastors and a lot of different preachers. Um, you know, I study behind people that are not even preachers or pastors. I study behind people that, that say things that absolutely thrill me because they, they, see, they see God and they, they, they know how to, to explain it. So I just, I just hope, you know, so if you ever think, well, Bill, really, that was really a good saying. If you look at my notes, it may have somebody else's name on it. Amen? I just all fairness. So R. Ken Hughes gives us the following illustration. Marco, excuse me, Mike, Micro, Angelo, Michelangelo. Well, see, I've got the whole illustration messed up. Marco Angelo was once asked what he was doing as he was um, chipping away a shapeless rock. He replied, "I'm liberating an angel from this stone." So he and and, and I knew I'd read somewhere else where he'd he'd look at a piece of granite or whatever he was using, and he could see what he was gonna. Finish with. Most of us, we see something and we just go up there and bust it all up and it all be messed up. But he could see that angel or, or David, the statue of David, a lot of other things. So that's what God's doing to us. Every one of you should have the feeling you've been chipped at a few times. Amen? If you're not being chipped on, are you then one of God's children? If he doesn't push back on you sometimes, you're not doing life. Life brings us against God. It might be hard to swallow, but every time you sin, you're going against God. And so as, as he works out things in you, are there things that you don't, ever, you don't do anymore that you used to do? That's, that's, how you, that's how I know you've been chipped away. And God wants you to be chipped away. And that's why he works on you all the time. So the ultimate sculptor who created the universe out, universe out of nothing, he's never thrown a rock away that he began on. So the word created means to form or to shape. It refers to making something out of nothing. And it speaks of a new thing. That's what the child of God is. One moment, we're dead in trespasses and sin. The next minute, we're a brand new creature. Think about it. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 talks about you are now new. You, you're new in Christ. He, each of us, as Christians, we're new creatures. Old things are passed away. All things are, are new. Something has never been before is now present. 
You were dead in sins and trespasses. Now you're alive. God brings you to that point. And as surely as the stars, planets, and the sun and moon declare the existence of a powerful God, nothing declares his glory, his power and existence, any more than a life that has been redeemed by grace. Think about it. Think about how, you know, I, I, I was ashamed one day. I, I was down in Gainesville, and I was, had been called on this particular account for about six months. And um, so I, I was actually just, you know, coming in to kind of substitute until I got a new guy that's going to be in there for a long time. So we came to the window one day, and we were talking, and I was introducing the new guy and all. And somehow or another, it came up in conversation that I was a Christian. And the lady behind the window said, oh, if I'd known you were a Christian, I might have bought from you. I didn't need her buying from me. But it shamed me that she didn't know I was a Christian. And that's, that just struck me to my heart. I thought, wow. Because, you know, I went every two weeks for six months. So she never saw a difference in me than other people, I guess. So that, that spurred me on to make sure that I witnessed, talked, or shared Jesus Christ with most of my customers. And at one time, you know, everything's changed in the last two or three years in sales. Um, not only just the, the COVID stuff, but, uh, you know, before even they, they, I mean, it was just a whole another, another whole world just kind of flipped by from what we used to do to what we did. And they, they would separate people, you know. And uh, so it wasn't as much talking as we used to have with, with people in an office. But over the 50-plus years I worked, you know, I witnessed to a lot of people. And I thank God for the opportunity. So every child of God who walks, talks, acts, thinks, and lives differently because of grace is a bold and powerful witness to the power of our great God. Napoleon, the French uh, military genius, he was, you know, the commander-in-chief, was aboard, aboard, aboard a ship in the Mediterranean one clear starry night. He was on the deck, and he was walking past a group of his officers. And, um, and they were mocking the one true God. You know, they were saying, God of creation, what a joke. He stopped, stared at them, and then he, with, with, with sweeping arm, he says, gentlemen, you must get rid of all these, and he's pointing to the stars, to deny there's a God. Now, as, as evil, the, evil as that man was, he still understood there is a God. And each of us, just by looking, you know, in Romans, the first chapter, it says, if you can look up, you can know. He says, the, 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 the man that's farthest away in sense of civilization can still look up and know there's a God. So when, when man chooses to make his own God, or to make himself a God, then he has to deny that. We, as Christians, will have to be removed. Those that are in heaven will have to be removed before we can say there is no God. Think about that. We're the child, we're children of the King. We're the creation of the Father through the Son. And... Um, Paul tells us that we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Works do not save us, but works are a sure product of our salvation. When people tell me, I have no spiritual gift, then I wonder, are you saved? The Bible says each person in this room that's a Christian has one or more spiritual gifts. Amen? There are teachers, there are possibly preachers, Deacons in every church that may not be identified or called out. You know, it's kind of like it's kind of like deacons. The church is to call out the deacons. And, and because they're supposed to see those who are servers and those who are, are ones that will do for other people without wanting something in return. And the church is supposed to call it out. Individually, if you believe that you have a... a a gift, a spiritual gift, that you're a teacher, then that's upon you to learn, to grow. And I'm not talking about becoming, you know, a, um, a college degree person. I'm talking about you're to, to study your word, study this. Do you, do you enjoy talking? Do you enjoy teaching? Do you want to help other people? You know, those are, those are things the Holy Spirit will give you. And you say, well, you know, I'm just so shy. That should never stop you. 
The real thing that you need to understand is that God made you, and if he wants you to be a teacher or whatever position in a church, he's already given it to you. So he's chipping you away. He's making you become what he wants you to become. Think of all the people we know at home who should be here tonight. Now, I, I know that people are afraid. I got it. That's fine. But if they're not afraid, they should be here. Why? Because in numbers, we will fill all the places that we're supposed to have doing what they're supposed to do. It doesn't mean that we have to have 200 or 300 people in here. It means that we have to have two or three. And if God has set those aside to do his will, then that's church. But a lot of times with church this size, there should be more who are doing, doing more for the church because of God. So create in Christ these unto good works. As surely as you are truly saved, good works will mark your life. Do you remember somebody in your life that you knew was placed there by God that touched you like? Does anybody have anybody? I know, I know we're recording, but does anybody have anybody they can think of? But I mean, seriously, anybody got somebody? Miss Carol. Amen. Anybody else? Somebody the Lord used to touch your life? Amen. I hope everybody here has somebody that's influenced them and, or kind of pushed you or, or uh, corrected you. I remember as a, as a child uh, at, at, at Marietta Baptist, there were people that would correct me real quick. And, uh, but then there were those that, that loved me in spite of me. And I still remember them. The ones that corrected me, I just remember them as shadows. Yes, sir. Amen. 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 Uh, always remember, whatever's inside will work its way out. If we, if, we just, if we just understand how God works. Galatians 5.22 says, Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. But a crib, a but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bringeth forth good fruit. Every tree that, that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. So we come to, how about our, our, our word about walk? God would have us to walk in good works. The walk means to make one's way to regulate one's life, to make full use of opportunities. Sometimes, sometimes we miss things where if we just had our eyes open or we weren't upset or we weren't bothered or we, you know, all the things that can happen to us. I always think about how many times I've driven down I-10 and somebody's trying to run over me and all this other stuff. So by the time I usually get my first customer, I'm not in a good mood. Amen? You know? It, 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 so God, you know, he, thank goodness, he kind of calmed me down, pushed me back, things like this. And so now I just kind of, I just go, Lord, help me kill him. I mean, um, uh, move around him. Amen. Y'all didn't hear that. So God, God 
intends for his people to live, how does God expect his people to walk in love, in obedience, in faithfulness, in holiness? He saves us to put us to work for him, bringing lost people to his son, a lost world to Jesus Christ. I pray each one of us will consider and understand God has something for each one of you to do to be about his will. Let's pray. Dear Father, truly, we thank you for this time. I thank you for my brothers and sisters once again. I pray, God, even now, that if there's one or more, Lord, that's first and foremost lost, may they take this moment to turn their life to Christ. I pray, for Lord, for those that are not here that need your Son as their Savior. I pray for them, Lord. I pray, God, this church becomes the lighthouse you want us to be. I pray this in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. Number 400.